And we are live with our retail blowout highs and lows post NRF rehash. The hardest part for me of this whole show is going to be getting this name right. <laughs> We're going to try to do it the French way. <laughs> I'd like to welcome Guy Cortan to the to the show. How did I do, man? John, excellent, excellent. You get an A for effort and an A for pronunciation. All right, man. My French class is actually amounted to something. My mom's going to be so happy. So but, proud uh, of you. <laughs> yeah, she will be too. So, uh, so yeah, so um, uh, th this is really centered around sort of picking up where the big show left off. I mean, the the thing about retail every year is that uh, for so many years, I trudged through the snow and slush in Manhattan in search of retail insights. And truth be told, it is one of my favorite shows. Um, and I was hoping to kind of experience it a little bit virtually, but NRF doesn't really... Well, I'm, I'm trying to think of a nice way to say this. Not so great with the hybrid formats, but I'm not going to dwell on that today. Uh, but <laughs> but Guy actually was on the ground in the city. I was, yes. And so you're going to kind of give give us the bird's eye view of what actually went down this year, which is going to be cool. And then uh, also we've you've prepared some uh, overrated, underrated retail tech stuff for us. So that's going to be fun to go through some of that. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's such an interesting year for – for retailers with this sort of the lure of the new normal right around the corner, but not quite there. And, uh, you know, so much opportunity and yet huge logistical challenges. So I, I can't wait to kind of hear your insights on all of this. Yeah, no, absolutely. Looking forward to it, John. Really uh, excited to be on this and to uh, share some, uh, some of my experience from a few weeks ago in the, in the great big Apple and NRF. Awesome. Plus, I got an awesome hotel tip for you for next year. Hey, hey don't year. tell anybody else, John, because then we're going to be <laughs> fighting for the last. I room. know we will be we will be screwed again. Uh, so so yeah so uh, and and those of you in the chat, you know how the show works. Uh, post questions, comments, observations uh, anytime. Doesn't have to be about NRF at all. What we really want to take away from the show, I think, in particular, is just uh, you know how how we retailers can succeed, but also the pitfalls they want to avoid. So. Uh, so, Guy, why don't you tell us a little bit about just why you went to NRF here and a little bit about what you and your your team over at Texas, what you guys were trying to accomplish this year? Yeah, absolutely, John. So, you know, like all of us, right, these past two years have have just been crazy times, um, you know, from, as you said, virtual events to a lot of virtual meetings uh, and everything in between. Uh, and And for me and for us at Texas in particular, you know, when NRF was coming around, I think it's a, it, it remains a very important show. Uh, and I think you kind of stated this, and, and I will say this from my perspective, you know, in the how many 20 years now I've been going to NRF, uh, it doesn't feel like the year really starts until you've gone to NRF, right? Until right. you've you've gone to, you know, with uh, 30,000 of our closest retail friends, uh, usually in the cold of New York City at Javits, and you've sustained yourself on a cliff bar for lunch. And uh, next thing you know, you know, you've walked your 50,000 steps, but uh, uh, the great pandemonium of NRF. So for us, it was really important to be there, and for me in particular, uh, to be there. And, and I was, you know, hopeful uh, as NRF was leading that we would uh, have somewhat of a normal NRF, uh, that we would have, you know, the ability to interact, obviously, with partners, uh, but also with customers and prospects. Alas, uh, with Omicron uh, rearing its ugly head uh, over prior to the holidays, but really hitting uh, full stride during the holidays. You know, you just saw a wave of cancellations, both from the vendor side and, of course, from the customer and prospect mm -hmm. side. We decided still to go because we had committed. And, you know, I will say this, like, you know, my, my reflection on it was it was time well spent uh, for me. I had some really fantastic meetings with other partners, other vendors. Um, what was interesting is, you know, you got to spend a lot of time with them partially because there are no customers and prospects there to for us to meet with or for them. So from that point of view, I think it was really time well spent, and I certainly got a lot out of it. Having said that, you know, it was it was tough. I mean, it was a uh, twenty percent capacity. And that might be mm -hmm. that might be um, being generous. Yeah. Um, you you know this, and anybody who's been NRF knows. You're right. There's two floors. Uh, the main floor, obviously, is is where all the big players are: the Oracles, the SAPs, the Manhattans of the world. Uh, empty. You know, the that whole first row where you usually get the big spenders, right? When I was, we talked about this before getting on the call, right? When I was at I2, I remember we had our booth at the top of the escalator. Yep. You know, we spent well over six figures on all that. And I think into the seven figures, um, gone, just empty spaces, uh, literally just 
chairs and tables there with nothing. Um, and my, you know, Jamie O'Halloran, who's, who's our VP of alliances with me, he, he had a great joke. He said, wow, I can see the back wall of Javits. Like I've never seen it before. Right. Cause all those banners and everything were gone. Mm -hmm. So I think from that perspective, it, it was a little disheartening to see that. Um, and what was interesting was the, as those of us know, uh, you know, who've been to NRF, the, the, the bottom floor, the basement usually is, is kind of, you know, you got a lot of startups in there, smaller right. vendors. Yeah. You'll go walk around it. Um, that was a place to be this year. It was really interesting. Like there was very little attrition down there. So there's a lot of good buzz and energy, uh, on that floor. And I actually had some couple of decent meetings, uh, with some folks down there. So that was really positive from that perspective that, you know, you didn't have sort of this visual, you know, this, 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 this uneasy visual feeling that you had on the first, on the main floor where, like I said, there was literally vacant, massive spaces uh, where no one was. So from that perspective, you know, overall, I was glad we went, we, we accomplished what we were there to do. But from the perspective of, you know, having meeting prospects or growing our pipeline, it, it certainly fell well short. Not that we expected to do much right. there with what was happening. Um, and I will say this, you know, I, I'm going to sort of praise and then criticize NRF in general, the, the association. I think they did a really good job with regards to um, having COVID tests. Like people were, you know, were able to get a free take home COVID test on site every day. And, and it was not limited to one or two. They were like, you know, take as many as you need. That was very good. Uh, they did a very good job, you know, getting us all to leverage like clear and other apps to get our vaccinations updated and then to be able to show that before getting onto the floor. Um, it felt like we were at a concert way to wear these green wristbands, but again, good, like make sure everybody's, you know, following the proper rules. I will give people credit to 99.9% .9 of everyone was wearing a mask. Uh, the only time I didn't see any was of course eating or drinking, but for the most part, everybody was my little negative towards NRF is I, I feel they, they, they kind of painted over what the reality was with, uh, you know, rose colored glasses, if you will. I don't know if it's a real mm -hmm. saying, I just made it up, but you know, after the first day, I remember seeing a post from NRF and, and I think they had their president or, or one of their executives walking the floor and, and it's, you know, I'm in marketing where I wasn't marketing. So I know the tricks, right? They, the way they took the picture, they were at the registration desk and it was in such a way that it made it look, there's a lot of people there. Well, there weren't. And the way they made it sound was like, Hey, you know, NRF 2020, things are fantastic. So many people are here, et cetera. And I was like, come on guys. Like, you know, we're all posting pictures on Twitter and LinkedIn and Instagram and TikTok and all that. You can see there are not a lot of people here. So let's not, you know, let's not kid, right? Let's be honest. Let's be open about it. Uh, I think that was a little bit, I looked at that as a little bit of a negative. And, and again, just some of the conversations I had with some of the vendors that were there, I, I respect that they were not, they were frustrated. I think they were, they were told prior that no one was going to cancel, that things were great. Uh, and they showed up and all of a sudden, you know, it, it looked like the way it did. Uh, and you know, I get it. NRFs between a rock and a hard place, right? They, uh, they, they didn't want to cancel, which I'm glad they didn't. Uh, but you know, so they try to make sure people were still going to show up. Uh, but the reality was people didn't. So overall glad I went, uh, we at Texas certainly got what we were looking to accomplish there, which was meeting with a bunch of partners, continue that conversation, you know, going out and seeing what else was out there. Uh, we were not able to, again, from a prospect or, you know, customer perspective, uh, get a lot of value out of it. Um, but you know, it, it's the strange times we live in, John, you know, what, what can we do? No, absolutely. By the way, uh, your compadre, Scott Luton says, hi from Metro Atlanta. Scott, hey, Scott, Scott, thanks for joining. Feel free to contribute a question or comment as we go. Um, I, I don't want to spend too much time on this sort of art of events thing, but I do appreciate your candid comments. And I think um, that was actually one of my struggles leading up to the event was I felt like NRF wasn't tuned in to the pulse of what I was feeling from my colleagues around their trepidation around being there for various reasons. And I think it would have worked a lot better for NRF. And, and I say this just because there's a lot of other shows coming this year. If they had been a lot more prepared for a hybrid scenario and not viewed the online component as such a terrible negative, uh, you know, fall, fallback position, but actually a vital part of the event. Cause so for example, I can tell you 
there were some pretty important customer panels that took place at that event that virtually nobody actually saw uh, because they weren't recorded and they weren't yep. broadcasted. And so that's a real shame because you have some really important retailers sharing stories and, and literally a handful of people actually saw or heard the stories. And I think uh, I really hope that NRF learns from that a little bit because look, I mean, this is going to go on and, and we're going to have various surges at certain points that, that, that make people reluctant for whatever reason about an in-person scenario. And um, I think, you know, NRF can learn from this, but I, I hear you. And, you know, I kind of heard the same thing from a couple other people there, which was, we made the most of it, but I, I can see if you, I, I can see if you were someone who shelled out a huge amount of money and that was the core, you know, centerpiece of your marketing budget where you would kind of be like, uh, what happened here? Yeah. you know? So, well, and to your point, John, I think it's spot on. And, and this is, again, I don't want to pile on NRF, so I, I know it's going to sound like it, but I think it's a lesson learned there too, which is everything, you just, flexibility, right, with these events. Right. Like we are living, I mean, I know this is a massive cliche. We've heard it way too much the past two years. We're living in unprecedented times when it comes to this. We're all adults, right? We're all intelligent. We understand what's happening. I'll give you an example. You know, we, me, my colleagues and I had, uh, sort of a general floor pass, right? Which gave us access to obviously the floor, uh, whatever uh, speaking sessions were on the floor, but it didn't give us access to like the main stage. Well, you know what? It, it wasn't like there was a line out the door to main stage because no one was there. So we actually went up, my colleague went up and asked, well, can we just go? Like, we'd love to hear this person talk. And we were told, no, you're not, you don't have that ticket. And I was thinking about it. I was like, well, wait a minute. You know, you need to understand too, you, you've gotten people themselves who have taken time out of their calendar and their schedule to come to New York to speak on main stage. Do you want them to speak to an empty room or do you want to speak speak to an audience? So I didn't pay the full boat to go sit in there. During normal times, totally get it. I respect it, right? I got to pay for that access. I will do so if I don't. That means I don't want to go in there. These are unprecedented times. Maybe think a little bit differently and say, you know what? A, we're going to record those sessions because people like yourself might not be able to make it or others. But B, for the people that are there, let's open it up a bit so that we can be, say to them, hey, you've made the dedication to come here as well. Yeah, you didn't pay full boat. But you know what? We also want this person who's going to speak at main stage to have an audience of people that are actually want to listen to what he or she has to say. So cool. to your point, from that perspective, I would, I would emphasize to anybody out there running events for the next year, you know, think about these things, right? Be flexible. Yeah, and 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 I think that spirit of improvisation isn't doesn't come easy to a lot of event people, but that's kind of what it is, right? Is that you you're you're adapting even after the event starts, you're making you're you're ready to make adjustments, like you said. Maybe you upgrade some passes for certain people or whatever it takes, because that's that's the situation we're in right now, and we all we all want to be a part of a successful event in whatever way we can. Yeah. Um, well, I think I think that's those are really good takeaways for the year for other event people. Um, let's talk a little more about about just just retail in general. I think I think retail is is kind of at a, a fascinating point because I think that you know we we've know some things right. We know that that we don't know exactly how the consumer would behave if there were no safety considerations. But I think we're pretty confident that a lot of the digital behaviors that have learned are going to stick, uh, mm -hmm. you know, to some extent. And, and that of course makes this omni consumer thing really challenging for retailers because the expectations are, are, are very fluid, right? I might go back to the store tomorrow, but the next day I'm going to want to pick up outside the store. The next day I'm going to want a delivery or whatever. Um, you know, and I'm going to want this more seamless experience. So I think we know that. Um, but the other thing I think is really interesting is I had two experiences over the holidays, uh, the, uh, the, you know, the classic logistical snafus that you would expect, but what they showed me after dealing with customer people in both, um, Walmart and Amazon, who are supposedly the vaunted re leaders in, in the backend logistics is that the customer service reps had no visibility into these backend systems. And, and these are the two leading retailers in the world. And they literally had no idea where my stuff was. And I thought that was really fascinating because, because if it, it told me like that we have so far to go. Right. And I think, I think that that's what's interesting is that we sometimes say, well, you know, Walmart and, and Amazon are winning and everyone else is taking it on the channel or whatever. But I don't know. I, I feel like we're emerging into a spot where there's a lot of interesting opportunities for a lot of retailers. And so I'm excited just to hear your take on, you know, what you're seeing and and start to identify some of the some of the ways in which some retailers maybe can excel and, and some of the things they want to avoid. So I Let's let's hear your thoughts on some of that, and then we'll maybe start some of the countdowns that you have in a little bit. 
Yeah, well, you you jumped the gun, John. I, I actually have that on my countdown list. Oh, you do? Of, okay. Yeah, it's one of the things to look for is, is the whole fulfillment, right? And and the whole the aspect that we take for granted, not take for granted, but but we we forget at times the complexity of it. And, and I think your your example of Walmart and, and Amazon is spot on. I mean, I think what we we certainly we we assume, which we shouldn't do, but we just assume or we expect that, oh. Well, everybody has visibility into where my package is, right? Because it's it's all digital, and right. um, when I order on Amazon or Walmart or Target or you know who Etsy or whatever you know ecom platform I go through, Shopify, that they're going to be able to tell me down to you know within a five foot radius and within a ten minute time frame exactly where everything is. But then when we look at it, or or, or for those of us who, who you know have lived in this space for as, as long as I have, like we realize, like I mean, that's pretty complicated. Um, and I think mm-hmm. what's happened is, you know, our consumer expectations have outpaced the realities of the world. And part of that, I'm going to blame our friend Jeff Bezos for that. Why? Because there is no reason why there are certain goods that you and I should expect to get in two hours or two days. Like mm-hmm. if if I order uh, a new sport coat, yeah, I want it whenever I when I want it, and I want it soon. But do I really need it in two hours? Do I need right. it in two days? Um, I mean, I'm going to date myself here, but I remember as a kid, you know, we talked about this before, right? Uh, I'm a, I'm a Parisian. I was born in Paris, so I'm a good Frenchman. And I remember as a kid when I moved here to the states, right? One of one of the things I loved is I, I still love you know soccer, and I'm a huge fan of the French national team, and I would always order a jersey of the French national team, it, you know, and I remember I had to write it out, send it to my grandmother in France because I couldn't pay with an American check or credit card. I didn't have a credit card, but so then my grandmother had to write a check, mail it in to whatever retailer. And then four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, nine weeks, how long the boat took to get here, I would get this cool new Adidas, you know, France soccer kit. And it was fantastic. And I loved it. Um, that of course, that expectation has completely been turned on his head now, because right. our friend Jeff Bezos has told us that we should expect things to happen at this crazy breakneck pace of two days, two hours, instantaneous. And there's some things, yes, that we should expect. That we should expect, or we should have some instant gratification potentially. But what's interesting is, is here at Texas too. Like you know, one of the industries we work in is healthcare, and I've spent some time in that space. And you realize very quickly. Well, you know what? When when a hospital needs something, they need it. They need it in that time frame because there's a surgery happening, or you know, right. there's there's something happen, some emergency happening. Uh, uh, for example, there's a company I've been looking at called Zipline, which is the, not the retailer, but there's a company called Zipline that does uh, drones. And one of their drones they have, it's very cool. I recommend anybody to go look online. Uh, it's 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 a drone that looks like an airplane. But what they've talked about is they're using it a lot in, I believe, in Kenya. Why? Because they're like, roads are terrible. We can't deliver medical goods. So if a woman's giving, you know, mother's giving birth and all of a sudden she has massive blood loss, she needs that blood within Mm -hmm. half an hour to an hour or else she's going to pass away. Like this is time constraint is life and death. So that's why they need it. For me to get my GI Joe, the Kung Fu grip is not time constraints, right? Like I can, I should be able to get it within a, within a more reasonable time frame. And I, I believe, you know, one of the things I think we're going to start seeing more of, John, from that perspective is A, smart retailers setting more or better expectations with us, the consumer, of delivery on a more reasonable time frame. You want it in two days, two hours? Great. You got to pay for it. You're mm-hmm. willing to wait a week, two weeks, three weeks? Great. I'll give you a, a discount. Um, you and, and part of that, too, now, this goes back to your question the challenge of that is going to be greater visibility and greater connectivity within the retailer or the network to truly understand what is capable when it comes to that fulfillment. So when you call that customer service person, they can't be like, John, who, what? And then be like, well, what package? I don't know where it is, right? We're going to have to be able to have that transparency where they're going to need to know where the package is, but more importantly, what is the expectations of that package and what actions can you or can they take on your behalf to fulfill that order the way you want it? And I think that is absolutely something we're going to see more of uh, as we go into 2022 and beyond. And I even, I picked on Amazon, but even Amazon, if you look sometimes, right, there's certain things where they'll say, 
hey, are you willing to take this package or this product on this date? We'll knock right. off five cents, 10 cents, whatever. Look for more of that to happen. But to your question, a big part or a big roadblock for all this is going to be enhanced visibility into where's my package, where's my inventory. More importantly, when's it available? How's it going to get to me? What are those available modes of transportation that you will take on my behalf uh, to get it to me? And finally, when are you the consumer available and willing to receive that package? Right. I think that's something we forget. We just assume, mm -hmm. hey, John, you want this in two hours when we drop it off. Well, wait a minute. John's not home. John's in Aruba. He's not back for another five days. Uh, it's going to sit on his porch. There's a snowstorm coming. Whoa, not good. Like, not good. But the, the, the retailer, the shipper is like, hey, I got it to you in two hours. My job's done. I've had some interesting uh, interactions with Amazon delivery drivers over that very topic. Because <laughs> their KPIs are based on the assumption of universal availability of me to receive. So Yes, uh, which... Uh, which we all know is not the case. I mean, I, I'll give you an example, right? We we ordered I mean, a couple of times now. My girlfriend and I have ordered some furniture, some some stuff for the house, and it's like, well, we'll be there in, in tomorrow. Well, no, I, I don't want it there tomorrow. We're not there. Send yeah. it to us in like four days, five days, a week. Uh, we one time did this. They sent it. You know, they're so proud. They sent us the rug ahead of time. Well, we weren't home. We were gone for like five days. It came back. It was sitting outside in the rain. <laughs> Right, bad experience. Yes, you hit your KPIs. You got it there within a certain time frame. Consumer still not happy. Right, rugs in the rain. Ouch. Okay, so I think that sets us up nicely for to count down your top five uh, overrated uh, retail or overhyped uh, retail technologies. This can include things you saw at NRF, but it does not have to be limited to that. Uh, sometimes the folks at NRF can get a little over the top with certain things like tell you that for past years. So let, let's, let's have one of those. Give, give us one of your top five overhyped retail tech. All right. I'm going to give you, uh, uh, I'm going to give you my, my number two, then we'll go back to the other ones. But I think the one I, I think is overhyped is this whole machine learning AI. Um, and I saw this in an I know, I know. Wow, dude, come on. I know. <laughs> nice. Wow. Going after machine learning and AI. Yeah. Yeah. First, wow. went, yeah, I, I drew first okay. blood on that one, right? Do explain. Do explain. I'm impressed. So I, what I want to say about machine learning and AI is it's not that it's it's not a good technology. I, I believe in machine learning. I believe in artificial intelligence. Again, I'm going to date myself. You know, when I was in college, I studied computer science. This was last century. We were already talking about AI back then. It is not a new concept, right? We've talked about artificial intelligence. We've talked about leveraging computation power, et cetera, to, to determine patterns and to guide us. Again, I'm not saying that those are not valuable tools in your toolkit. What I am saying is I feel as if we've gone too far where part of his NRF, I did see this. There were a lot of booths where, you know, John, maybe five, six years ago, we walk around. You know what I saw in every booth? Cloud. Everybody was cloud, over cloud, 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 cloud. This year, everything I saw, well, not everything, but a lot of what I saw was AI this, AI that, machine learning this, machine learning that. And I always say, stay, sit there and ask myself, well, okay, great. So you have artificial intelligence, machine learning. What are you doing with it? What are you? What is the end goal that you're trying to accomplish with this? Is it just to say you have an AI layer and you can do something better with through data? Fantastic. We've all been trying to do that. Now we can just do it with more data, we can do it faster, right? All those things that the, the, the technology allows us to do, which is fantastic. But at the end of the day, we've been doing this forever, in my opinion, or at least during the, since the beginning of computation, we've been doing it in some form or another. So the problem I have with this buzzword or this technology is it feels as if we just throw it out there because we have to have a machine learning or AI strategy without thinking about what are we trying to solve what questions are we trying to ask and what are we trying to accomplish in terms of, is it creating a better workflow? Is it looking at inventory positions better? Is it, you know, I'm harking back to my days at Six River looking at warehouse robotics. Is it determining a better pick pattern at the warehouse level? Okay, great. Those are all very worthy and important goals to reach where AI can help me get there. But to just throw out machine learning and AI because it's the cool terms, I'm sorry. Like I'm putting my old analyst hat on here. But when I see that, I think back to the days of cloud where 
I'm sure you get this too, or you got this. I certainly did when I was an analyst. Like I would get briefings from vendors and the first thing they'd list on their thing is we're cloud. Okay. Well, why? I get it. It's yes. Well, you can upgrade and it's single source, blah, blah, all that stuff. Great. It's a tool. Now explain to me why you need to be in the cloud and what it's doing to enable you to solve your customer's problems faster, better, cheaper, whatever it may be. Same thing with AI machine learning. So I'm not saying it's the wrong, I'm not saying it's not a good tool. I'm not saying it's not a good technology. I just feel as if it is way overhyped right now without truly understanding, well, what is this doing for me? And what am I using this for to solve what problems? Love it. I mean, shots fired completely. I'm I'm glad I'm really impressed that you picked on the the gorilla in the room instead of nibbling around the edges there. Oh no, let's go right after them. No, that that's solid stuff. You know, it's interesting because one of the things that I've done along those lines is uh, the when I hear from vendors around this, a lot of times I'll hear about these various kinds of chatbots in the retail environment, and 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 I'm always come back and say they want to ha have me talk to talk to someone about it. I'm like, no, I want to interact with your bot. Like, <laughs> right. set up a time for me to interact with this thing, and let me see what I think. Yeah, and th this is where the silence ensues, and and I don't get the demos, but that's kind of where it's at for me. Is I need to experience this for myself now, you know, or you know, in some cases, I'm willing to talk to a customer, obviously, if who's right. using it. But but um, but it is amazing with some of the stuff. It's like, well, show me, show me how it's going to make a difference, right? Like, show right. me how it's going to make my retail experience better, and uh, that's not always so easy to do. So I'm really glad you started there. Awesome. Um, all right. Give us another one from your, from your five overhyped retail. All right. So my next one is, and this is maybe not a technology, but we talked about this. Maybe this is just okay. the term omni-channel. I'm done okay. with it, John. Yep. I'm okay. done. Eradicated. All right. Eradicated. Let, let's take it out of the Webster dictionary. We're not forever. using the word omni-channel. Okay. Yeah. Gone. I, and I've said this and, and I, I'll give some, some credit to, I think, um, I believe his name is Steve Dennis wrote a great, great book on retail recently, and, and he just talked. It's it's just retail. Let's not talk about you know e-commerce, omni-channel, this that. It's retail, and, and I think what the the reason why I I, I want to eradicate this term, and it's not technology, but a term, is I want retailers to think about it from the perspective of, at the end of the day, all that matters is you and me and everybody listening and our parents and our friends and all this is the customer, right? The customer. And the customer is going to want to interact with your brand, your retailer, whomever that may be in the buying or purchasing journey. And whether they do it through their phone, through a tablet, through carrier pigeon at the store, and then however they want to fulfill it, right? That is that is retail. And the fact that we have because I think inherently when we say omni-channel, John, what it says is that, well, there's multiple silo channels of how to get to you. Mm -hmm. Really? I mean, yes, I get it. Hey, I go on my phone, you know, and I do a transaction or I go in the store. Yes, they're different channels. But the reality is this, and, and we've seen this, and it still happens at times, which I think is shocking. But I'll give you an example. Um, you know, a large uh, retailer in France called Darty, they are basically... Uh, kind of a, 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 not a home Home Depot, but they basically, you know, uh, consumer electronics, uh, white goods, you know, a whole host of items, massive retailer in France. And I remember this a few years ago, my aunt was looking for a new dishwasher. She went online and got one price. She went in the store, got a different price. Like, whoa, like that's omni-channel because I have different channels. Bad, right? One price, one experience for the consumer across all channels because it's retail. When I interact with Adidas, I don't care if I'm if I'm online, I shouldn't have a different feel than if I'm in the store. What I mean by that, of course, I know I'm in digital online, I'm physical in the store. But the brand, the the pricing, the product selection, uh, the 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 look and feel uh, needs to be consistent across all of that, right? The customer uh, sat experience, the satisfaction, all of that has to carry across all the channels. It's retail. It's not, I, you know, and what's interesting is, and I, I've certainly gotten this soapbox recently is you look at some of these retailers today who are now talking about respinning out their e-com platforms or their e-com practices from their other retail. And, and I, John, I'm, I'm serious. Whenever I see these articles, I just want to like smash the screen on my head because it's like, what are we doing people? Now I know part of it, 
is a financial exercise where our good friends on Wall Street and the bankers are saying, hey, we're going to do this, get a pop, make some money, and then you know we're done. We don't care because we've made our money. But as someone who's lived this and who's in the space and who's seen this from you know when I was at For Forrester Research in 1998 when all this was starting, and I remember seeing people like Walmart being like, well, we have our retail practice, and that thing over there is our econ practice, and the two shall never speak. Well, what happened? They realized, whoa, this, you know, inefficient, customers the same. We have to have unified experience. We have to have unified inventory and all this, these things. So the fact that we're trying to re, you know, go back to this, I'm like, what are we doing? Like, we don't, we, we don't live in a world, you know, especially now we live in a digital world full time, 24 seven. We don't differentiate where we associate. If I look at a brand or a retailer, I don't go in a store and if the, the service level is poor, I don't say, oh, that's okay. Their e-com experience is fantastic. No, I, I hold you accountable to all of those channels. So the fact that we keep talking about this term omni-channel, in my opinion, has a connotation that we still have separate ways of, of interacting with the end customer, separate ways of servicing her, separate ways of making her happy, separate inventories. Now, I know it's not always the case, but I think the more we we get out of this notion of calling an omni-channel, just realize it's retail, right? It's retail. Be where your consumer has to be and make her happy, period. End of story. Well, I'm not sure what retail marketers are going to do. You've taken away <laughs> omni-channel and AI and ML. Um, <laughs> I got more to take away from them, John. No, I, I cannot wait. I mean, this is, this wow, this is gold. You are going for the jugular today. This is really this this surpasses expectation. All right, give me another one from your overhyped list. This is going well. So my overhyped my my other one, which kind of relates to Omnichannel, is social commerce. Like I've been hearing that a uh -oh, lot. Oh, here we go. Yeah, I I know I know I've been hearing this recently. Uh, oh, you need to be social commerce, social selling. W what does that mean? Okay, great. You you're on TikTok and you have a promotional video. I can click something and buy something. You're on Instagram. Uh, and you're putting a post up there with a link to go buy something. Really? That's that's just a mini website. I mean, I get it. Like, yes, you you need to be on those platforms. I'm not saying you shouldn't be, depending on your brand. I'm not saying that there is not a uh, a thread that you need to pull there to be in these different channels. But this goes back to my 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 last statement about Omnichannel, which is let's not let's let's stop separating all these channels now. I don't mean to say to my friends out there in the retail space that you don't need to have strategies for each of these channels, but your overall thinking and mentality has to be holistic. And I think that's the same thing with social commerce. Like when I, I've been hearing this recently. Now, I do think one aspect of social commerce, which is not overhyped, but I think is, is a different twist on it, is the impact of you and I have through digital medium to influence and to potentially create brand awareness, et cetera, uh, that I get. And that's, that is more to me, not social commerce. That's just the power of digitization, right? That's the power of, we can have a podcast, we can have a blog, we can have a TikTok channel. Um, we can, we can sell things through that social medium that I, that I appreciate, but I think, I, I feel like this, this notion that, oh, we've, un we've discovered new gold by, putting, you know, something on Instagram and being able to sell through that. And that's not our, our new social channel. It's like, guys, you know, yes, you should be there, but let's not make it more than it is. Let's understand that. Yes, you have a demographic that will be there. This goes back to my Omni channel discussion. Be where your customer is. If your customer's on TikTok, you got to be on TikTok. If your customer is still reading the Sunday paper, you need to run an ad there. So, you know, Kind of, I feel as if recently we've we've kind of moved, and, and maybe part of it is the pandemic, right? We've all been stuck at home. We're all more on social channels through, you know, our, our webcams and all this. Maybe that's part of it. So I should I should maybe ease off on my 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 uh, my throwing slings and arrows at it. But I th I think for retailers out there, we need to think about this is a channel, just like I'm going to date myself. But just like that call center was a, was a channel right back in the 80s, back when that, you know, flyer in the local newspaper was a channel. These are all channels. Figure out where your customer is, figure out which channels appeal to her and then exploit them. But don't look at this like, oh, my God, we just discovered, you know, this is going to drive, you know, 50 percent of our revenue tomorrow because it's a social channel. 
I mean, mm. come on. If, if I'm if I'm selling carburetors, is that going to happen? No, well, maybe it does, right? Maybe there's an Instagram page on you know car enthusiasts. I'm sure there is. Fantastic. Be on that channel. But I, I, what, I what I mean to say, John, is is again, I, I feel like it's over, not just over hype, but I think there's it's 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 a false it's a false sense of wow, we've discovered something so super new that's going to change everything. Have we? Very interesting. So there's a, uh, as long as I can think back, I can think back to some form of a, that kind of cable shopping network vibe of, you know, uh, hosts like sh showing off products and you can order them and stuff like that. What I think is so interesting, uh, which I've seen a little more in Asian markets than, than in English speaking markets, but is the phenomenon of the live influencer trying products like, yes, like, and, and, I think what's what I think is interesting for retailers. And I, I agree with you about the whole social commerce thing. I'm not a fan of the term at all, but what I find fascinating is the sense in which, on some level, the retailers almost lost control of that environment. Right? That you know, and and I'm reluctant to give too much power to certain influencers, but I think there is the sense in which some of these folks do have an enormous amount of power, and I'm not sure that the average retailer is prepared for that not not that it's a social channel or anything like that but more that the lack of control they have over fundamentally just about anything i mean i guess they could sponsor the influencer and stuff but but i don't think they have a whole lot of control over these shows and i think that's really an interesting distinction and i think what's what's great about that part and i agree with you i think we see that happening a lot more in asia and you know go to the chinese market and good lord like that's just massive but I think what's good about that is sort of the the democratization, and I can't believe I'm using that term in China together, but that's the democratization, so to speak, of getting that message out there of your product, right? I mean, I remember this again, like when when you know you were given an ad and you or you you know, I, I woke up early Saturday morning and watched the cartoons and there's a frosted flakes ad, right? It's like, oh, okay, that's that's where you're getting that influence is by commercials and and things of that nature. But the one beauty of of the digital world, and I guess then by extension, this social selling is, well, the power now has been democratized, right? If if I get a million viewers on my YouTube channel and I'm pushing a product, I've got influence. You know, maybe I've got ten thousand people, maybe I got five thousand. It doesn't matter, right? I can peddle my influence uh, in a certain way, and, and I think that's an interesting, you know, not just retail, but just social phenomenon. Like, you know, I mean, my my fourteen year old kid, like talks about other his friends like they want to be youtube stars right they, they don't want to be michael jordan or you know be a be you know run a company they want to be youtube stars right that that's mind-blowing for me but to your point john i think it's something that retailers absolutely need to be aware of i would argue too i think what's interesting is a lot of this in my and maybe i'm being overly <clears throat> um naive on this at times but i think most of this is sometimes more organic and i think if if big and one thing I think that most big companies, retail or otherwise, are terrible at is trying to come across and influence the influencers because they go back to their old fashioned, hey, I'm just going to put an advertisement on your site and I'm going to send you money and then you're going to do what I tell you. And it doesn't work that way anymore. <clears throat> so I think that's part of it too. I think from a retail perspective, to be very conscious of is that the old fashioned way, like this is not Mad Men, right? This is not. Uh, we're gonna go down on, on in New York City, get an agency. We're gonna we're gonna mold and shape the message by just throwing money at it and, and you know using agencies. Uh, they're still part of that, but I think when it comes to the social selling, that part of it, a lot of it's organic, and I think a lot of it has to be treaded cautiously by brands and retailers. Take advantage of it, but more important thing, listen, right? Listen, just what is happening? Why are people gravitating to this influencer or that? Why are they pushing your product? What is so interesting about it that you can leverage and maximize, right? Don't try to control, try to listen and learn from that. Uh, because I think once you start trying to control, it then becomes corporate. And then we all know what happens with that. We're just like, oh, now we're just being sold to like, bye. Well spoken. Okay. So I want to get to your underrated countdown. So have we, is there anything more on that we need to bash first? Uh, do you, I'm going to bash this one, John. It's not really, again, it's not technology or anything. I'm just going to leave this one as it kind of leads into my, okay. my one that I think underhyped. The retail apocalypse. I know it's kind of gone away, but I still read it. I'm done with it too. Like, I can't, I, I, one of the things I love, love, air quotes, about, you know, 
what happened during the pandemic is we read more and more about the retail apocalypse. Stores are dead. Um, if we go even further back, right, we, we had famous internet pundits who said, well, why would we ever shop in stores? We're just going to do it all online. It's all just going to come through UPS and FedEx. Eh, nope, not happening. Retail apocalypse. Come on, people. Um, the, the beauty and the challenge of retail is that all of us on this, this uh, session and all of us in our lives are a major part of the retail ecosystem. We all shop. We all purchase products, whether it's food or cars or clothing or diapers, whatever it is, we are, we're all out there. We're, we're part of this. So I think one of the biggest, and it, it's gone down. So I will, I will freely admit this that, but you know, that, that whole retail apocalypse stores are dead, I think is, has become so tiring to me to read and to have to fight to some degree because it's, it's, it's not the reality. Um, and part of that too is, is, you know, when I, this is, maybe it's my little soapbox here, so apologize for one second. But when I hear people talk about this, well, the new normal of retail, what was the old normal of retail? Mm -hmm. Go back 10 years, 20 years. Like when mom and pop stores got steamrolled by Walmart, were they saying, oh, well, wait till the new normal comes back, we'll be fine, right? When general stores were coming out and getting rid of, of merchants or traveling you know, town to town, were they like, oh, don't worry about it. This is just you know, the, new re the new normal will come back. Retail has always been changing. It's always in flux. It's always evolving, like everything, it as it should be. So this whole notion of, oh well, let's just wait for the new real, the, the new normal. There's no normal. There's no new normal. There's no old normal. There's just today, and I think that's something we have to to be more conscious of because it's not as if we're just going to hit pause. Things are going to go back to the way we think they should be. We hit play again, and off we go. Things are going to evolve, and I th it's a good part. I think that's that's exciting. You know, I think that's 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 what makes the job fun at some level because it keeps pushing our thinking and challenging us. Um, but I think it's lazy at times to just say, "Well, we're going to go this this new normal." What the hell does that mean? Yeah, it doesn't feel like the uh, apocalypse so much, right? I mean, it it does seem like there's probably a few there's there's some more malls that are going to close that are in the wrong spots, but um but even a lot of malls have undergone a significant reinvention and are staying open just with uh, like I have a couple of local malls like that. It, the type of store has changed dramatically, but the mall hasn't gone anywhere. Um, so, but one, one thing I think is interesting though, like, which is not the retail apocalypse, but I think is an interesting drama to follow is I think a lot of old school retailers with heavy store footprints, if, if, if they could overnight snap their fingers and have no stores and then re-rationalize their store footprint from scratch, I think a whole bunch of them would take you up on that offer, right? And I yes. think, that, and it's not the apocalypse, but it is a challenge because in the new store that they're thinking about, they might have different locations. They might prefer to have a warehouse in this location and nothing customer facing. They might prefer to have more kiosks. I mean, Starbucks is obviously kind of struggling with, with some of that now. More, more drive up stuff would have been better. Um, less, ho you know, office and hotel locations. But, but, but I think a lot of retailers have kind of had this moment of like, yeah, I'm glad I have stores, but I, this isn't really the footprint that I would have wanted, you know, so that's going to be interesting. Yeah. I, John, you're spot on. And that leads into one of my, one of my things I'm looking for, which is exactly oh, that right. it's the store, right? I think the store is, in the midst of a very cool transformation. Now, I just went on this little rant about there's no new normal, old normal. Things are always in flux. The store's always been in flux too, right? To your point, I think the store's always changed. We've gone from small footprint, big footprint, malls type stores, super stores, right? Malls, you know, stores way out in the suburbs because we all had cars, right? To now things like, you know, if you go to London, right, you have Metro Tesco or you go, you know, you have city targets here in the United States, right? Smaller footprint stores to be in more you know, suburban, urban areas. So I think from that standpoint, we're going to just continue to see that. But what you said, I think is a hundred percent spot on, which is what I, I'm excited to see. And I think we're going to see more of, it's not necessarily less stores, but the redefinition of stores, right? The reconfiguration of stores. Um, I think it was Walmart just came out recently, announced some new store formats. So I think that's very exciting from that perspective is that you're going to see, and you should see, a, an evolution or a consistent evolution, if you will, with the store. You know, uh, Dick's Sporting Goods is a great example, right? They opened a uh, a store, I think it's somewhere in Pennsylvania or New York, 
right? Which, which has like a full soccer pitch outside. It has a track outside. It has a climbing wall, right? It has all this experiential uh, uh, things or locations that you can try stuff on. Uh, you know, we've seen this at REIs before, and I think you're going to see more of that, right? You go to REIs as a climbing wall, right? Bass Pro Shops are a perfect example of this, right? People, um, people are going, I mean, I, I remember having Bass Pro Shops and Cabela's as clients where they would tell us people would go and schedule weddings there. Why? Because there's a big fish tank and there's like a boat in it, right? But it's all experiential. And I think that's the, that's what we're going to see more of, uh, as opposed to less, you know, and, and experience is not necessarily having a climbing wall or a fish tank. I think it's also with the garage of the service, right? I look at one of my favorite brands, uh, Indochino and Bonobos, two of the, my favorite brands, but Indochino in particular, right? They've opened a lot of uh, uh, stores. Now they started out as an online bespoke suit manufacturer where you would take your own measurements, you send it in, they'd manufacture suit in China, send it back to you at a very you know reasonable price. Um, funny side story, don't self measure yourself because it always ends up wrong. Um, one day, John over a beer, I'll share some pictures of my first suit I bought through Indochino without having a proper measurement. It's kind of comical. Uh, oh they fixed it, but you know, anyways, but what they're doing now is they're opening stores, right? And I went to one, it was a fantastic experience, right? It's basically taking, you know, Savile Road experience in London and bringing it to the masses, if you will. Uh, you, it's, I mean, yes, it's a tailor for lack of a better term, but when you look at it, the experience when you walk in, right, they don't have any inventory. They have samples. So you can see different fabrics, different patterns, different colors. You can see some suits and such to see what they look like, but the whole store experience is to be what, to be measured, tailor measured, go through the process of picking your fabrics and your patterns and all this. And then you you walk away, or you pay for it, you walk away, and then it gets mailed to you down the road. So that store experience is very different than a traditional clothing store where you walk in and you say, all right, I'm a 44 regular. What do you have? Okay, I got a blue suit and a gray suit. Which one do you want? They don't fit great, whatever, but I'll buy it and I'm off I go. So that experience, and we're seeing that more and more where, and within even store within a store, we're going to start seeing that where part of it's going to be experiential, part of it's going to be maybe a different brand in there. Right, we're seeing that with Sephora, I think, with store to store, like at Kohl's and things of that nature. So I think to your point, you're spot on. That's one of the things that I'm excited about for this year and beyond is how do we redefine the store experience and therefore the store layout, the store utility? To your point, do I start turning some of my stores into micro-fulfillment centers? Do I start turning some of my stores into return centers? Um, I think there's there's a the, the, the ability of retailers to think creatively about how they leverage their footprints is what is going to define which retailers do well and reach which retailers go out of business. And because the reality too, is if you look at it, guess who's opening stores, Amazon. Whoa, what are they doing? Well, because they realize that there's just so far you can go with a customer experience. If you don't have a physical location, you know, if you look at other companies like Casper mattress, uh, all birds, Warby Parker, right? All these digitally native brands, are opening stores. Now, it doesn't mean to your point, it doesn't mean we overstore it and we build, you know, 80 stores overnight, but we have to figure out where that store fits in our strategy and what does that store look like within that strategy and then what is the sort of diversification of that store within all of our footprint because some stores to your point, maybe are just micro fulfillment centers, some stores are going to be like a uh, 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 you know, Indochino guide shop where I just go in and see stuff. So there's going to be mixture, you know, a mix, a mix of, of, of uses for those stores. Absolutely. Uh, Brent saying good convo, Brent. Yeah. Uh, if you missed the beginning, Guy was taking shots at AI and machine learning and <laughs> omni channel. Uh, we also had some good Amazon talk in the beginning, Brent. Um, and by the way, uh, Brent's uh, watching Amazon show leads in here. At, we lead into that at, at top of the hour. Uh, so around the time when we wrap, you can head over and they got a lot of stuff to talk about this week because uh, I'm sure you'll be covering the the prime pricing uh, uh, rip off. Sorry, increase. And, increase. Uh, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to say rip off. Moderate tax increase. Uh, in, in order to watch crappy. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a content surcharge for crappy, crappy original shows that, that no one watches. Oh, and um, NFL games that I already pay for through my cable provider. Awesome. Um, anyhow. 
So uh, that that's coming up, Brent's show uh, in just in just about a little more than ten minutes. So I highly recommend the show. All right. So so Guy, uh, what else you got on your underrated retail tech collection? I think the next one is uh, supply chain. Supply chain's cool again, or cool? Maybe it never was cool. Maybe it's just becoming cool. You know, I think it's underrated. Maybe it's not underrated anymore because you know I, I watch local news here and other places and. I've heard my local broadcasters say the word supply chain more than once now in the past two years, which is like mind blowing. Um, but no, I think, you know, it's, 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 I don't want to say it's underrated, but I think it's, it's coming more to light the importance of understanding your supply chain, understanding how it functions, understanding how to leverage it to maximum efficiency, right? You made a great point at the beginning of this talking about your experience at Walmart and Amazon, where you had customer service people who, didn't know where your stuff is. Well, guess what that is? That's a supply chain problem, right? Yeah. I should know where your stuff is in my supply chain. So I think what we're going to see is a, a, a spotlight, which already has been, but I think creative or savvy ret retailers are going to start realizing or thinking about how do I make my supply chain not a cost center, but a, but a innovation or a customer driven engine for my brand, my retail, whatever that is. What I mean by that is, you know, how do I ensure that I am maximizing what I can in my supply chain, making it reducing friction, greater visibility, all those buzzwords we use, but the reality is we need to do that for our supply chain. And how am I more attuned with that supply chain? Because at the end of the day, you know, and I'm this is terrible when I pick my mom. I love my mom to death. She's super smart. But during the pandemic, she finally kind of understood what I did as for a living because she was like, oh, that's why there's always toilet paper on the shelf at the supermarket. That's why, you know, we can get sanitary, you know, hand wipes at the supermarket on a regular basis in normal times because of the supply chain. So I think what we're going to see is much we should see is savvy retailers understanding the importance of their supply chain, elevating that conversation to the board level, to the C-suite, right? It's not just about your merch planning or your e-com site or your, you know, whatever that means. It's your supply chain has to have. Uh, a, a place at the table, if you will. And the pandemic has only shown us the importance of that. And I, I hope, maybe hope is not a strategy, I realize that, but I do hope that most retailers will take that to heart and will actually you know, be much more conscientious about their supply chain moving forward. All right. So what else do we got on the underrated <laughs> list? I think the other underrated one is uh, sustainability. And I know it's people might shake their head and say, what do you mean underrated? It's kind of all over the place. We hear about all the time being green, being sustainable. I think where it's underrated is how companies will truly embrace sustainability, not just from a business perspective, also from a socially responsible perspective, but from a way to communicate with their customers. So what do I mean by that? We talked about it earlier, John, when it comes to fulfillment about, well, you know, if you want something in two hours, maybe I should charge you more money or if you know if you can hold off or, well, what if I could also give you a sustainability measure? Hey, John, you want this product in two hours? It's going to burn a lot more CO2. Are you willing to wait? Yeah, I think you, I think some people will. Some people might not care. That's okay. But to me, it's, it's sustainability. When I say it's underrated, I think the way we leverage it and the way we uh, communicate that with our end customer is going to take a bigger and bigger role within our overall uh, ecosystem as we move forward. I started seeing that, speaking of NRF, uh, a few years ago at NRF, I started seeing it on the grocery side where there are a lot of companies in the grocery side who are saying, hey, we're going to use these magic mirrors or scanners at the produce level. So you're going to buy an apple, you can scan it, and it's going to tell you you know, where it was sourced, how much water it used, how what was the transportation cost to get there. Um, great idea. I think a little bit too early. What I mean by that is we just as consumers, I don't think we really thought about that. I think we're starting to see that more and more, mm -hmm. especially in Europe. Uh, and I think what we're going to start seeing is, you know, savvy retailers not only looking at sustainability as to how do I drive more revenue. So like Levi's taking water out of their production of jeans, right? Great cost savings, but also good for the environment. But also savvy retailers saying, how do I leverage sustainability to build a more intimate relationship with my customer? And I'm going to use this term, make it more sticky, right? Because if my customer or my consumer is going to be more sustainably savvy, 
I want to show them that I'm following suit and make it, maybe they're willing to pay two or three bucks more for a product because they know I'm going to be a good steward. Right. So I think that's something that I think is underrated. It's not the sustainability, but it's how retailers are going to leverage it and how they're going to build tighter relationships with we as consumers uh, that care about these things. And the numbers bear it out. Right. I'm just going to give you a quick number. 87% of Americans would buy from business who advocate social and environmental needs. And 76% would boycott companies uh, who will not be sustainable. So the numbers bear out. Now it's from, I think, an Accenture report, right? The numbers are starting to show that we as consumers are going to vote with our pocketbooks and our wallets uh, based on sustainability. Indeed. Very good. You know, it, I've, I find myself wondering, and you, you, you gave us a couple of really excellent lists there. I find myself wondering if you saw anything that it, uh, that that you thought was like cool tech that was legit. Like I remember like if uh, I've done some next gen tech videos at, at NRF and a couple of them I really liked. I mean, I, I did one, a really early contact with shocking shopping thing that I thought was pretty cool a few years ago when that was still more like science fiction. Um, you know, I, I tend to be sympathetic to the contact like stuff because it feels like, like, post pandemic, even, you know, no matter where we go from here, we're going to want to have less like germ exchange <laughs> for, for lack of a better way of putting right. it. I feel like those technologies kind of have an edge right now, but then there's a limit to it, right? Because you start getting into facial recognition stuff and yes. then it starts to feel a little queasier as far as like, yeah, well I could pay with my face, but I'm not hundred percent sure that I'm ready for that. You know? Like, because if I can pay with my face, I don't know, maybe someone else can. And I'm not sure if I want you to have my face. <laughs> Wait, so, what, was that, Nick, what was that Nicolas Cage movie where you swap faces with someone? Oh, and, yeah. <laughs> Crap. I'll have to pull up a Nick Cage uh, filmography, which is quite right. extensive uh, while we're talking here. Uh, if only he'd only been in a few movies. Uh, unfortunately, he's been in like every movie ever released. <laughs> so, but, but did you run into stuff like that where you were like, oh, that'd be really cool or, oh no, the trade-offs of that are like kind of yucky or. I did. And I'm glad you mentioned it. Cause uh, I will give Amazon credit for this. They had, they had a booth uh, at, at NRF, not even a booth. It was literally a gross, a little grocery shop and you would badge in with your credit card and then just pick up items and just leave. And it would charge you. Um, I thought that was pretty cool. Now I know they're doing it already. It's not, you know, it's not, brand brand new but i certainly think scenario yeah i i think to your point you know going back maybe to what i said earlier about the whole omni channel stuff gotta go away that's just an example i think of you know we're, we're bringing the experiences of that we want as consumers from any channel and making them available to all channels right so the amazon one click which is brilliant and absolutely horrible because it makes it so easy to buy stuff that i don't need but bring it to the physical world Right um, now, I, I understand there's 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 hurdles, as you said, fish recognition or other parts with privacy. We have to worry about that. There are other hurdles with regards to the hardware needed to do all this. But I, you know, where's the biggest bottleneck in your supermarket? It's at the cashier line. I mean, that's the bottom line, right? So, what if I could speed that up? I mean, I remember being in England um, years ago uh, in Birmingham, I think, and I went to a, a massive Tesco. And I was fascinated because they already had the um, the scanner guns that you could just take, right? Walk around with your shopping cart, scan stuff, put it in, scan stuff, put it in. I was like, whoa. With Yes, with John Travolta, that's right. It was um, called Face Off, wasn't it? Face Off. Oh, yeah, yeah, what a yeah. great movie, right? How original. Yeah, absolutely. Anyway. But I think that that type of technology, I absolutely, you know, I, I, I was very impressed. I've heard a lot about it. I finally got to use it. I was really impressed with it. It's very seamless. Now, again, it was a very controlled environment. You know, there's one person at a time at most going through. It wasn't like there's 50 of us. Uh, the skew count or the, the you know, merchandise in there was very limited. Um, but I think that was very interesting. Um, I do think, you know, <laughs> I do think that, um, you know, when we look at automation, I think there's still some exciting stuff out there with automation. Uh, I think we're only at the beginning. And, and of course, you know, my prior job working in automation space, I certainly got a, a front row seat to this. At NRF, which was fascinating, I, I did fail to mention this, it was it was interesting to see the number of uh, automation players that were there, 
right? From Geek Plus to Locus to Auto Store to Right Hand Robotics to some others, um, which I thought was was very encouraging, right? It was cool to like we're getting out of the warehouse and getting in front of retailers, right? That, I thought that was very positive as well. I'm not sure. I, I don't know. I mean, are you Thomas? Are you asking pay with your face? Who, who would accept that currency? Was that is that a self deprecating humor or is that uh, like an NFT, right? Yeah. Um, the 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 point uh, I wouldn't get too hung up on paying with your face. The point is that that facial recognition does figure prominently in a lot of scenarios that retailers discuss about the future. So I think it's an an interesting point to to think about for a moment. Uh, I I do want to linger for a few uh, and and discuss this one other topic with you that I think brings some of this to a head, which is that uh, I I have another retail piece coming out soon. I did a a discussion with Qualcomm on 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 what they were previewing at NRF and one of the things that that I keep coming back to is the dilemma of the so-called store associate because the mm. now the the specialty retailers have kind of figured this out by by creating more of a high-end customer experience in stores but but I I believe that the the so-called bigger box retailers are going to need to bear down on this issue. And I th- what I think is interesting is that it seems like early solutions have focused on automating the hell out of things and, and essentially uh, alleviating themselves of the cost <laughs> and expense of the store associate entirely. But I think that full autom- automatic feature, that might work in some contexts, but I think in a lot of contexts, it doesn't work that well. And, and when I was talking to Qualcomm, they were talking about like, well, you know, what if, instead of someone just stocking the shelves in the produce aisle, there was someone who could talk to you about different health regimens or different diet plans or, you know, so it's, it's, it's like the, the associate becomes more of a value added advisor on the, on the floor, perhaps is skilled in things like upselling or promotions, who the hell knows. Uh, I think this is something that's going to have to get reckoned with because I think there's this desire to automate the crap out of the experience and just get rid of employees because they're disgruntled anyway. Um, they're, they're a cost, they're a cost item on our balance sheet. And I, I think that's the wrong headed approach. I now, now granted they may have to have less employees in order to make that this work. Um, so I'm not going to say there's going to be no job loss here because you, you can see it at self checkout already. But the yep. point is, the point is, at what point are we, are these bigger retailers going to understand there's going to be competitive advantage to actually hiring people, paying them an actually decent living freaking wage they can live on and encouraging them both with the technology in their hands, but also in, in their training to interact with customers on a higher level. To me, that's the future of retail, but I will, we'll see because I'm not, I don't think that's really been figured out yet. I think you're, you're hundred percent spot on. Right. And I, I think the the problem we have is that we, a lot of times I feel like the pendulum swings too far. So let's just automate everything or nope. But you're absolutely right. I, I think what the lessons of the high-end retailers who get this are going to push down. And, and then the, the other example, which everybody always uses, which I think is worth remembering is what was the value or what was the great part about, you know, the, your local delicatessen is you'd walk in and they'd be like, Hey John, how are you? Right. How are things going? Oh yeah. Your, your usual order. Right, there was a personalization that only that human could get. Now, some of my friends in AI would say, "Well, we'll just AI everything and we'll scrape all the data and we'll figure it out." And it's like, "Whoa, that now that's getting too creepy, right?" So I think there's got to be a balance. But if I look at the high end retail, I think those lessons are going to trickle down to the more general retail, right? If you go, for example, uh, I was in Paris, you know, before Omicron. Uh, and I went to to buy my girlfriend uh, a gift at a very high end store um, in Paris, and it was fantastic. Like the experience, part of the experience was the white glove experience of treating you like you were the only customer. While there were many customers in there, but it was interesting. And and this is the part that was interesting too, John. Like they integrated technology with the personalization. So I went to the store. The only store they have is in Paris. There's a line to get in, so you're waiting outside. As you get closer to the front, they would have a store associate come out and they're all, you know, well tailored suits and they have a handheld and they'll come up to you and say, well, what are you, you know, welcome. Thank you for being here. You only have about 30 more minutes or 20 minutes to wait. What is it you're interested in? Oh, you're interested in this. Let me see my inventory if we have it using technology, right? They're going to scroll through and look at it. You want to know what the price is. Here's how much the price is. You want to know what colors we have. Here's what we have. 
Some might say, well, just put a kiosk out front and I'll just punch that in myself or just send me the stuff on the app. But there's there's a there's a a human element of it where that store associate is going to come out and spend that time with you, right? To walk you through and answer any questions you may have. I think that is going to to trickle down to other retail because that's where I think the f- differentiation, the reason why we have stores is you're going to have to have that human component tied in with some technology and automation. Absolutely. But there has to be a balance. I mean, at the end of the day, if if I walk in a Home Depot and there's no one in there and it's just all screens, I can punch stuff. Why am I going to Home Depot? I'll just stay on my phone and do it. And I'll just get it, you know, pick up online, pick up at a curb front or just send it to me, right? Part of the value I go in is, you know, I go in and I talk to, to store associate Neil about doors and he has all this experience and he can walk me through it and he can tell me this and that and help me make a decision based on my needs. Right. And yeah, you know, AI and CRM and all that could maybe, maybe give me a decision tree to figure that out. But, you know, there, there's value in me going in and talking to Neil because maybe he sees something that I didn't think about or just having that human experience, right? Part of, you know, when I laugh about social commerce is that retail in and of itself is still a social activity, right? Part of it is we still go and we shop. Now, buying is not a social activity. Shopping is a social activity. So I think part of that, that, that human element uh, is going to absolutely continue or should continue to play a role. It doesn't mean automation and technology doesn't have a role to play as tools, but that human component is still valuable. And to your point, John, I think what's going to be the challenge is I can't be paying store associates 15, 16 bucks an hour and they're temporary. They're going to be there for three weeks and leave. How do I build my rapport as a brand with them to them? They then take that on to the customer. Yeah, absolutely. And and to me, that it's exciting to talk about this because I think to me, that's a feature of retail I can get excited about because frankly, like I, I, I don't try to go to Walmart very often in my town, but I would say it's more of a dystopian than a utopian experience in there right now. You know, it's just the feeling of like that, that the store is basically bereft of anyone who could possibly help you. So right. hopefully, you know, hopefully you won't need any help. And then at the front, the self-checkout, it almost feels like TSA. <laughs> you know, they got something hovering over me. There's cameras everywhere. Like, it's basically like we assume you're a shoplifter until <laughs> proven otherwise. This sort of mentality there. Like, that's that's not retail utopia. That's, that's to me, that's a just, that's like 1984-ish vibe in there. And, um, and, and so I think retailers need to reckon with this because I think there's a better future out there that strikes a better balance for everyone for what what the workers are capable of what the uh what the customers want and 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 like i said i don't think the specialty retailers are having this problem in the same way right um, you know i mean one of the things that is so fantastic about nrf every year and i i assume you do this sometimes is go on some of these tours and 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 go into some of these cutting edge retailers that are smaller shops and stuff and just some amazing stuff that I've seen in some of these locations, right? Like even, even something simple like an espresso location where like, yeah, are they sell an espressos. I don't know. It feels like a coffee bar. They're like serving up all this awesome free coffee. <laughs> right. I'm like a freaking espresso machine before I left that place. And like that was right. the last thing I needed is to be like slugging down espressos all day long. But right. like, but, but this ambiance was so fantastic. And so to me, like there's a lesson there. There's a real golden nugget or there's a retail lesson that, that the bigger retailers can learn from that at, at scale, but it's going to take some work They're They're not nearly there yet. You know, they're not. And I think to some degree, it's, it's not for everybody. Right. And I, you know, we didn't talk about this, but I think there's certainly a distinction between buying and shopping, right? Like buying, okay, I need a bar of soap and some tissue paper and some chicken. Okay, I'm just gonna go buy That's it. That's the Amazon Go kind of thing, right? Like, yeah, I, I want to buy this. If I don't even have to see a person, that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> you know, that, just but there's some, yeah, and there's there's some experiences where I want to shop, right? And 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 I, and I think part of it too. I think and this part I think is is interesting, and I think you're spot on with this, John. Is to think about it is it's also not just one size fits all, right? And, and I think this is something where I again I'm gonna get get go rail against some technologies again, but. I feel like sometimes we talk a lot about like clienteling and, and all these things where we put this in our POS, which is all fantastic, but they're all tools. And if I'm at one brand 
I don't want to deal with that customer the same way as if I'm in another brand, right? There are differences. You have to have that subtlety that just because the numbers say, all right, this, you know, Guy's coming in, he's this age, he spends this much, blah, 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 treat him this way. No, right? There, there has to be that nuance. Uh, and I think that's where, to your point, right, these, these retailers who get that, I think are, are already or, or should be a leg up on those that, that just sort of fall back on the, well, I'm just going to put it in my CRM and my, my, my POS system is going to tell me how to do this. It, it's, not, it's not formulaic, right? We, we, this is going to be a cliche, but we are all humans and we all have our, our different you know, tastes right. and wants and needs. When we're shopping, I think we have to be very sensitive to that. I think when we're buying, we have to be a little bit less, but we still have to have, you know, there's still, there's a reason why, you know, if we go out there and we look at grocery stores, there's, you know, five different, you know, stones throw for me. There's, you know, there's, there's a star market, a Whole Foods, a Wegmans, right? And they're all different. They're all different. They all sell the basic products. I can buy chicken from all of them, but the experience is very different. You know, the way they cater to me is very different. Some are more shopping experience, even though I'm buying something. Some are just pure, hey, utilitarian, I need to buy this in and out, done. Yep. Absolutely. All right. Well, I think we've reached a good stopping point. Before we go, I'm going to send out a couple things. Let's see. So uh, I don't know. I've in, in Since Digenomic I started, I've written something like 1,300 blog posts. I'm not sure. At least two of my top 10 favorites were written about NRF. One of them was my confrontation with the co-founder of the Happy or Not uh, is real time customer feedback a dream or a, a nightmare? I'm going to paste a link into that. Uh, if, I think if anyone wants to pursue this conversation, I think that's that's just an example of why I missed that show and why I think it's such an important show is to have those kinds of conversations. You just you you can't put a price in that. Um, and then uh, I remember interviewing the Target CIO a few years ago. I'm not going to post a link to that, but but that was really cool. Just in the basement of of NRF, kind of pre some of their really notable success during pandemic times. Now, granted, they had a bit of an advantage with the demand on their uh, on on their particular inventory, of course, from consumers. But I think Target's executed about as well as anyone. So I would encourage you guys to check out some of our retail on that. And then I've got a really good interview with Guy that uh, took place last April uh, for Medium, Authority Magazine. So if you want to follow some of his thinking, I'd recommend that. I'm going to post that through. And with that, I want to thank you for this terrific conversation. You brought your A game today for sure. Going to give you the applause. Oh, look at that. Yep. That that was right behind me. You really, uh, you really framed the conversation so well, and I think really kind of gave me a little bit of what I had missed uh, in in uh, in the snow and slush. So thanks for braving the <laughs> New York hotel scene and getting the good info for us. So happy to do it, John. And, and let's let's fingers crossed that next year we'll be back in that snow Indeed. and slush with you know forty thousand of our favorite friends. Maybe we'll be doing it in person as well. Love All you. Right. Pleasure, man. Thanks. Thanks, John. Appreciate it. Thanks, everybody.